Well, I, I think I was going to uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, I, I think you want to talk about the East China Sea, but I was going to kind of broaden it because there's so much, so much, so much going on out Absolutely. there. I mean, my general view is, is that I don't think there's any real mystery to what's uh, going on in the Asia-Pacific region uh, today. In fact, I was just talking with one of uh, fellows from the, that works on the Hill currently, and I remember my days on the Hill in the late 1990s when we were talking about China's rise and all the challenges we were going to face and the bracketing of Taiwan with missiles during their first democratic elections. And then uh, interest in China and its, uh, the spotlight and it kind of fell away during after 9-11, and understandably, understandably so, and it's almost like we're back there again. Uh, the same sort, of, same sort of issues, except China's a lot more muscular and powerful today than it was back in the late 1990s. Uh, basically, my bottom line is, is what you see is what you get out there. Um, China's increasingly powerful, uh, militarily, politically, economically, not that it doesn't have its own share of challenges, um, and I think it sees the United States in decline. And it's taking advantage of that. Um, and as a result, it's, ex it's uh, exercising increasing levels of assertiveness uh, to protect and advance what it sees as its rights, no matter how mind-boggling it, it seems to the rest of us, especially some of these territorial claims. I mean, I think these actions that we're seeing out there, whether you're talking about in the South China Sea, basically claiming the entirety of the South China Sea, which is like over a million square miles of uh, ocean territory, uh, in, with this U shape, this nine dash line that they talk about. Actually, I recently saw a researcher in Britain, uh, whose name escapes me for the moment, found that China had actually added a tenth dash to that nine dash line on one of their official maps, something that came out of Sino Press, and that includes, now it includes outside of Taiwan as well. Uh, and if you want some really interesting history, check the history of that, that nine dash line, which actually goes back to the Republic of China itself and, and China. People's Republic of China basically assumed that same claim that the Republic of China on Taiwan had made in the late 1940s. Anyway, these, these actions we're seeing out there with the ADIS, with this harassment of the U.S. ship, the USS Kalpin, um, I think is just, you know, it, it kind of really undermines China's continual trumpeting of their peaceful rise. And to me, it looks more and more like trumpery than anything else. I mean, for example, there's this ADIS in the East China Sea. Um, while well, Beijing is predictably defending its uh, air defense identification zone, as everybody knows what an air defense identification zone is, against international criticism citing double standards, the fact is that China has a point up to a point. They're right. Many countries have ADISs. The United States has an ADIS. Japan has an ADIS. South Korea has an ADIS. And they, these ADISs do serve uh, national security purposes. For instance, during the Cold War, uh, the United States 80 was meant to differentiate, you know, a Soviet bomber coming to nuke Washington from a civilian airliner coming to deliver pas passengers to Washington. And in fact, my experience flying with Navy uh, EP-3s out in the Pacific against the Soviet Union, we dealt with this issue quite a bit. Um, it, but it's clearly an important distinction uh, when you're talking about an ADIS, its purposes of, of pr providing air defense at the same time uh, allowing uh, civilian passenger airliners to pass peacefully through uh, into uh, your own territory. But the new Chinese ADIS actually goes above and beyond your run-of-the-mill ADIS, providing reasons for concern. For instance, China's requirements are unprecedented. Uh, not only will civilian aircraft entering an ADIS have to report, uh, file a flight plan in advance, check in with Chinese air control, and follow instructions, all aircraft will. Now, it's, it's standard practice for, say, a, a, a plane flying from Tokyo to Chicago to enter the American ADIS, you know, having filed a flight plan, check in with the American air controllers and say, you know, this is United or whatever airlines flying to Chicago. And so this way we know what kind of aircraft it is at a, at a great distance. Now, um, but the Chinese are now saying that not only we have to do that, if you're coming into our national, then uh, that's only for entering into our national territory. Chinese are saying if you enter the ADIS, not only do we have to file a flight plan and check in with us, you have to follow our instructions. The United States does not enforce the requirements of how you operate in international airspace, which is outside anything outside of 12, 12 nautical miles, just like uh, national waters. So the Chinese, these precedents are un, unprecedented. In other words, not only will civilian aircraft 
have to check in with the Chinese. So will military aircraft. And this, this goes against uh, common uh, international, international custom. Basically, you need Beijing's permission to operate within this air defense identification zone. And it's also worth noting that an air... Peter, if, if I may, yeah. as I understand it, it involves just transiting the... Absolutely. Any, not, any not operations within into. that aid is. Yeah. See, normally it's only required that you identify yourself if you plan on entering national territory. So if you're flying to Beijing or Shanghai, that's, that's, that's fine for them to require that because they you're going to be approaching their territory. But just operating within the ADIS is not, generally is not a requirement, and the U.S. doesn't do it. Now, it's fine for them to set out, send out fighter aircraft if they want to check out what sort of aircraft it is. I mean, we did, they did this regularly against us when I flew EP-3s in the Soviet Union. We were flying in international airspace. Uh, they would send a, send a fighter out to identify us, um, and, that, and that was kind of it. Things got a little rough, rough in 1987 after Matthias Roos flew into to Red Square, but um, you know this was something that was something that was something that was done. And we same thing today. The Russians are flying bombers in international airspace off of Alaska. We sent out F-15s to check them out and see what they're doing. So the Chinese are asking for a higher standard than than is normally than normally is expected. We need Chinese permission to operate anywhere within the Chinese aid is. Now, once again, an aid is is an arbitrary set of lines put on a map or a chart. Um, the China, but the Chinese decided that they would allow it to overlap with South Korean and Japanese uh, ADISs, making folks there none too happy because there was no prior consultation. Uh, and of course, there's always the nationalist issue that you're dealing with when you're dealing with uh, in Asia. But perhaps worst of all is the Chinese decided to include disputed territory within that ADIS which is the Senkaku, as the Japanese call it, or the Dayu, as the Chinese call it, uh, highlighting what I think is probably part of China's latest effort at creeping sovereignty, as we've seen in the South China Sea and elsewhere. Uh, it's not, and not exactly the right way to, end a, you know, to deal with a long-simmering territorial dispute um, you know, with uh, another country uh, and a clear challenge to the Japan and, the United, and its ally, the United States. Making matters more perilous, Beijing is patrolling the ADIS with warplanes, supposedly. And I think that probably increases the chances of a, a tragic mishap like the Soviet shootdown of KAL-007 in 1983, or a Chinese fighter collision with the U.S. Navy EP-3 in 2000, 2001. I mean, analysts say that beyond this East China Sea ADIS, that uh, China may also put one over the South China Sea. Uh, which, would, which has territorial disputes with places like the Philippines, Vietnam, among, uh, among other countries. I mean, this follows on China's excessive claims over its exclusive economic zone, which, as you know, China basically considers to be uh, sovereign territory. Under the UN law of the sea, customary practices that 12 nautical miles are your national territory and anything beyond that is the high seas. Now, within the 200-mile ec uh, exclusive economic zone, you can operate some sort of sovereignty over the, the harvesting of national resources, such as fishing, etc. But the Chinese are treating those waters outside their, their territorial waters as Chinese uh, sovereign territory. And of course, this, is, uh, this was shown perhaps recently with the uh, near collision between the USS Kalpin and a, a Chinese uh, destroyer in the South China Sea. Uh, my understanding is that the U.S. ship was operating in international waters, was not operating in an in any way that was hazardous to navigation, uh, and uh, some the Chinese uh, uh, unfortunately um, exercised some poor seamanship that may have uh, led to a collision between the U.S. cruiser and the Chinese destroyer. Um, and I think this is only per LST. what's that LST. LST. Uh, in other words, I think what you what you have here is is that if um, once again, I think, you know, what you see is what you get. The Chinese are, are more powerful than they've been in the past. Um, they think the U.S. is in decline, and they're willing to assert these sort of, uh, these sort of uh, rights, what they consider to be rights. It's my sense that if, China, if countries acquiesce to Chinese assertiveness through passivity, China will be able to eventually exercise control over these disputed areas in the Western Pacific, whether you're talking about the East China Sea or South China Sea. In other words, Chinese claims will become a fait accompli. Of course, at the strategic level, I think the thing I worry about is that what does this say about the new Chinese president, Xi Jinping? I mean, my, my assessment is that he probably has more influence 
over the uh, foreign and defense affairs of the, of the People's Republic of China today than any leader since probably Mao. Um, and what we're, he has been in my understanding, of course we don't have a tremendous amount of insight into Chinese uh, decision making, but my understanding is that uh, he certainly was part of um, the decision to implement this ADIS. Uh, which they knew would be a provocation to uh, the United States and other, other countries in that part of the world. So what does this really say about him? But I think if this, this ADIS Act is any indication of, of uh, what's to come, it looks like we'd be in, plenty of, be in for plenty of uh, political military turbulence in that, in that part of the world. So I'm concerned, and, and you, should, you should be too. So I'll stop there, and if I'm sure there's questions and uh, comments. I'm glad to take them. Peter, thank you very much. Um, could I just ask you to, uh, to, to elaborate on that last point? Uh, the question that has really arisen in my conversations with experts like yourself on these matters is that uh, the military is rising. Mm -hmm. um, China is having difficulties on a lot of different fronts, but the military is unquestionably benefiting from the cumulative effect of investments over the years. And that Xi may be um, in his position to some extent, certainly enjoying the control that he currently has, which I think has been sort of unprecedented in, since Deng's time at least, I guess, in part because of the military support. The question I've, I've had is, is the military supporting him because they believe he will let them do what they want? Mm -hmm. Or is he really directing where things are going, do you think? I think he's... My sense is the latter, is that he has close ties with the military. If you notice, he picked up the uh, chairman of the Central Military Commission position much earlier than they normally is, is granted to the leader of China. Uh, he was named the party secretary. He became the president. Uh, and generally, there's a bit of time before they pick up the CMC job. Uh, but he picked it up right away. And my understanding of his background and biography is that he has longstanding ties with the People's Liberation of Army. So they're, they're close. Um, it's not going to be one of these sort of things where, you know, in, in this post-Civil uh, War generation or post-World War II generation, uh, where many of the pr prior leaders had gravitas with, uh, with the military because of their involvement in the Civil War, et cetera. Uh, this, is a new, this is a new generation, but this individual has, uh, it seems to me, influence and clout with the military as he came into office. He didn't have to develop it. So there weren't as many grinding of the gears. And I think that um, my sense is, is that um, he's involved in this decision making. Um, you know, there's, it's, always, it's very interesting. The PLA seems to be quite, there's always questions about Chinese decision making. Um, we don't always understand it. It's very opaque. I almost feel like you're back to the old Soviet Union days with trying to read the Kremlin tea leaves. Um, and um, what's clear to me is I think is that the PLA is quite integrated into, into the decision making. Uh, he's a kindred spirit of the PLA. Um, I think that they'll probably listen to his direction. But he's more, he may be more, um, he may be more willing to hear them out and take their point of view on these, on these sort of issues. Now, when you see something like the uh, USS Kalpin, um, you have to be careful to differentiate the actions of, a, of an on-scene commander and national policy. I mean, it, I, my belief is that, you know, the Chinese, uh, even in 2001, didn't send that fighter up there to, uh, to collide with the EP-3. Um, this was a decision made by a hot dog pilot who thought he was a better, better stick than others. And I think that's what you got. And it's not clear whether the incident with the uh, USS Kalpin was a, an on-scene commander or something that came down from a higher level. We don't know that. Or at least I don't know that. Maybe somebody do, within the U.S. government does know that. So that's one of the things that's important. Um, but who knows, maybe it is Beijing's policy. Uh, they, obviously, this was a sensitive thing to the Chinese because the U.S. ship was, was uh, shadowing the Liaoning, their aircraft carrier. So, um, but. There's still, there's still huge issues there. One of the things I think that is interesting is I don't think that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs plays any real role in, in foreign policy decision making in China. I think they're, they're a bystander. Foreign policy and defense decision making, my view is, is that it's made by a very small group of individuals at very senior levels. 
and then that's why you find the Ministry of Foreign Affairs occasionally caught unawares when there's like an anti-satellite test or something along that line. And in some ways, I probably believe that they didn't know that it happened uh, because they just weren't cut in on it. So it's different than our State Department, which is usually highly integrated into national security and foreign policy and defense and defense decisions. So it's different. It's different over there. But yeah, I'm very, um, I'm very concerned. I mean, there's a little bit of loosening of things at home, some reforms, not so much politically but on some other issues. Uh, but I think, like I said, what you see is what you get. Unless we see some changes in, uh, in Chinese foreign policy, I think this is reflective of the new Chinese leader. Good questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, so first, thanks for being here. Um, I had wondered if you can elaborate a little bit on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think sometimes with these trade agreements, we tend to focus um, a lot on the economic implications and not as much on the diplomatic and national security implications. And, and I, so two questions quickly. One is, is it accurate to say that if TPP falls apart, um, that a lot of these uh, countries, at least on the Asian side, will increasingly fall into China's orbit? And, and then second, I, I noticed last night that Taiwan is now interested in joining the TPP. And maybe if you could comment briefly on that as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say that economics is my, is my strength, uh, frankly. So I'm, I'm going to probably be pretty limited in, in this. But it is, an, is a, critical, a critical part of what, we're, of what the Obama administration is trying to do in, in, uh, in that part of the, in the Asia Pacific region. I mean, they will say that the, the rebalance is not just military, it's diplomatic, it's trade, and obviously it revolves a lot around um, the TPP and efforts, and efforts, uh, efforts there. And obviously economics gives you is will give you influence in any part of the world. It's critically important to your, your foreign policy your foreign policy efforts, and they will downplay what's going on with the uh, on the on the security side. Um, you know, my concern obviously is is that um, we put too much emphasis on diplomatic and trade, not to under under. Uh, underestimate the importance of trade and our influence in that part of the world, but I'm really worried about the security things. Um, I'm worried about our defense budget. Uh, we talk about a pivot. I've said previously publicly that I think it looks like it may be more of a pirouette than a pivot uh, because we're just, I don't think we're, I'm worried about our ability to resource uh, any sort of military effort in that, in, that, in that part of the world, especially dealing with the tyranny of distance, how far it is. I mean. If any of you ever traveled to Asia, you have to go out there every once a year just to remember how far it is. It's not a lot, like a quick flight to Europe. So, um, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to leave actually leave the economic issue to an expert, and I would check I would recommend that you check out what the folks at Heritage are saying that are that are dealing with those issues. Well, Jeff may have some thoughts on it as well when we get to uh, your part of the presentation. Uh, yeah, and you actually know something about it, Kevin. Yeah, if I could try to uh, relate the TPP with uh, security. Uh, first of all, we've run the TPP. You might just introduce yourself. I oh, think you Kevin Carnes, like U.S. Business and Industry Council. Um, since NAFTA, and the TPP is another trade agreement in the NAFTA model, we've run a $10 trillion trade deficit in goods. Uh, the China trade deficit is a, a fairly large percentage of that. and. We keep pushing these trade, uh, trade deals without looking at the effect on our industrial base and specifically our defense industrial base. The reason China is able to project power is, you know, in part, the $315 billion trade deficit that the U.S. ran with them. I mean, we're, we're funding their military, so we get hit twice in a sense. We lose factories and jobs get displaced, and then U.S. taxpayers have to pay money to build up our defenses, so it's it's uh, you know a negative twofer. Uh, the the TPP itself, the U.S. is a latecomer. It's not just Taiwan, and you know South Korea wanted to join last week, and Japan joined um, uh, last May. Uh, I was stationed in Korea and Japan when I was in the Foreign Service. Uh, they've run consistent uh, trade. Uh, surpluses with us, and somehow the Obama administration thinks that in you know six months they can turn around 65 years of history with Japan and you know access their markets. I can tell you it's not going to happen. Whatever the words on the paper say, 
So I think we need, we have this kind of bifurcated vision um, that Peter in a sense indicated, you know, the, the security people do security and the trade people do trade. And, uh, you know, no one wants to look at massive currency manipulation by uh, China, Japan, Korea, Malaysia with its currency board, et cetera. Uh, they don't want to look at the loss of industrial capacity in the United States. And, uh, you know, again, it's a negative two for you lose capacity. We have all these foreign components in our weapon systems. The primes can't tell you, you know, what, what, what's in the, the uh, subsystems that they, you know, they buy from the second, third, fourth tier uh, suppliers. Um, so we need to, you know, we need to look at this thing very carefully with a much broader view. Thank you. Anyone else? Dan? So we talked about the uh, collision. What, I'm not really getting what the downside is for China in uh, allowing this type of conflict to occur. Even in the worst case that we would have had the collision, we would have lost a $2 billion warship and they would have lost an LST that's not that important to them. Um, you say you're not sure if it's even done at a high level, but supposing for the sake of argument it is, mm -hmm. what's the downside for China in having this type of rivalry? Isn't it kind of expected? And what I, I'm just not seeing from their point of view why this is a disaster, possibly well, disastrous policy. I, I think it's, uh, to me, it's, it's uh, fairly obvious why there would be uh, counterproductive. I mean, China for many years has been, they've changed the names over the years. In fact, they've even moved away from the idea of peaceful rise, cognizant of uh, history and, you know, the concerns about the rise of a new power in the international system, whether it's, you know, Athens and Sparta or Wilhelmina, Germany or Imperial Japan or the Soviet Union. So they've moved away from that and talked about peaceful development, harmonious development, et cetera, et cetera. They have all of these sort of words. And I think they're, they're worried about China's soft power. Uh, and its influence. Um, they don't want people to, as political science would say, bandwagon against them. If they start to come across as um, a bull in a china shop, it's probably a better, somebody's probably used that somewhere in a, one of Frank's probably used that in one of the title of his columns, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. Right. But I mean, if you, if you come across that way, they, they don't want to create resistance to what they're trying to do. I mean, if you look at, uh, there's a famous saying by Deng Xiaoping, whether we're misinterpreting it or not, it's a 24 character strategy, it talks about, you know, biding your time and, you know, keep your profile low and, you know, things along this line. Um, and I think that there's some truth to that's China's hoped path. And that's why I'm kind of surprised by some of the things that Xi Jinping uh, may be involved in or policies that he's setting on the security side. I mean, they don't really want to see um, Japan become a nuclear weapons state or South Korea to do things that would be uh, inimical to China's, China's security. They don't want the United States to really get very bothered and, and decide to shift, you know, 80 percent of their ships to the Western Pacific and reestablish bases in the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a downside to this, and I think the Chinese understand it. And that's why there's, we have to move beyond just listening to their rhetoric and look at their, look at their actions. Um, in fact, we, we may see a cooling off after this because the Chinese will realize this may be counterproductive. Uh, what Jeff will talk about India, I mean, how is India going to react to this? I mean, there's a lot of history out there. There's a lot of issues. There's no shortage of nationalism that the countries are trying to, that are trying to deal with. Uh, and I think it, I, I would say for China, and I think they probably understand it, that it's quite counterproductive to, to try to create, uh, create problems that they don't have to. Like I said, I think what they want is people to be passive as opposed to reactive. Uh, and um, that way that some of these things uh, may become a fait accompli and their creeping sovereignty will have achieved what they wanted to and it will no longer be creeping, it'll just be sovereignty. So I think there's, there's a definite downside. There's a definite downside to this for China because the way they'll be viewed by others. others. For instance, Japan just increased their defense budget again. Um, you know, South Korea is ignoring the Chinese aid is. I mean, they have issues too. I mean, the Korea, actually, there's, there's disputed territory between North Korea and China. I know it's not a united country, obviously, but there are, there's a lot of history there. Uh, Korea suffered a number of, uh, has suffered thousands of invasions from, the, from China. 
over the years. There's a lot of history. Um, Taiwan, what would Taiwan do? Would Taiwan, you know, become a nuclear weapon state? I mean, there's all sorts of things that I think China has to be cognizant of. And I think if they stir up the pot too much, they may not like what they, uh, what they, what, what happens as a result of that. Peter, I, uh, let me just um, draw you out on one other point. I, I've, uh, it will be interesting to see whether we've kind of reached a tipping point where they think it's okay now. Yeah, they can, right. deal, they can deal with these. We'll see, right? That's always a <laughs> blowbacks by virtue of their overall power. But one thing that I, I, I just would ask you to comment quickly on um, that may illuminate kind of where they think they are and how uh, assertive they can be is uh, their space program. And I know that the Commission has spent a lot of time looking at that and trying to assess uh, particularly the military dimensions of it. Could you comment, especially against the backdrop of what um, they did last week with the soft landing of a sure. uh, lunar rover and, and where you think that leads to both with respect to the moon and more generally space control? Well, I, I think, Frank, there's a lot of dynamics involved with the space, certainly with the space program. It's high visibility. Uh, many of us are, uh, you know, some may remember our ventures into space and the, the national pride it brought about. And I sense that there, there is somewhat of a social contract between the Chinese government and the Chinese people. Obviously, it's a repressive state, but I, I think even dictators can't ignore public opinion to a certain extent. And the contract has been, I mean, I think one of the great examples of it was the Olympics, is that, you know, we will restore China's state in the, in the world order. We'll bring, you know, fame and positive uh, attributes to the word China, the brand China. Um, you know, we'll let you become rich. Just don't mess with the political situation. Just don't organize against us. And I think that continues. And I think the space program on the soft power side of it and on the domestic side of it, I think that's that's part of it. You know, it, it's a tremendous accomplishment. The U.S. is getting out. I, 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 have, I have no, this is just, a, I think, a statement of fact because I don't know enough about the U.S. space program, but we're kind of getting out of that business, right? Chinese are getting into it. And for the Chinese people, this is probably about as exciting for us as it was in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and there's obviously, as we, as we well know, anybody technically uh, knows that, uh, you know, there are military applications to the to space. And I think the Chinese probably know that we're slavishly dependent upon our, uh, our, our, our satellites, our, our satellites for military and other purposes. Um, and I think that they want to be a player up there. There's all sorts of other stories coming out, and I can't verify them because I just don't know, uh, probably because they're classified about you know, Chinese efforts in terms of anti-satellite capabilities, other than some of the stuff we've seen publicly. Um, but, um, you know, they're going to be a player there, and they know, they know our dependence upon it as part of their uh, asymmetric efforts against our strengths, as, along with cyber. Cyber is just not as visible and not necessarily something that people will brag about, but the space program certainly is, and I think it brings a tremendous uh, positive um, international um, re renown to, uh, to China and to the, to the Chinese people. So I think there's a number of different vectors that are involved with the Chinese, the Chinese space program. I'm not smart enough to tell you what landing on the moon will change in terms of China's uh, capabilities in space from a military perspective, but it obviously gives you a, a, an example of the, the state of their scientific and uh, technical capabilities and research capabilities. And I think that they will also bring them into other circles they previously weren't involved with uh, internationally in the international space, international space programs, which I think, once again, could benefit their military capabilities.